Good afternoon everyone. My name is Dr. Aman Jha and I am a nephrology resident in Apollo Hospitals. And I have with me here Dr. Satya Narayana. He is a eminent consultant nephrologist in Apollo Hospital. Today the topic for discussion is end stage renal disease and its management. We have conducted a survey on the doubts that people have regarding kidney disease and we will ask Dr. Satya Narayana Gane for the answers. Uh, the first question we got was, we are seeing a lot of kidney disease these days, sir. Why do you think that is? Uh, now, uh, there are a couple of things regarding this. The first thing is, definitely because of the lifestyle changes and the food habits, the incidence of chronic disease like diabetes and hypertension are in a rise. Now, with these, the complications of these disease like uh, kidney problems are also increasing. Uh, this is one way of looking at it. The other way is the better screening in these days. Now, uh, because of the availability of the tests and the frequent visits to the doctors, we are uh, able to screen the patients better and the number of annual screens that are happening, that is also more. So, we are able to pick up more number of kidney disease patients because of better screening facilities also. Third thing is the longevity of the people. Now, uh, the life expectancy has also has increased and because of the better medical care, the kidney patients uh, are living for longer time. Now, because of these, we are able to listen to their stories and we are able to meet them and talk to other people. Previously, once you have kidney disease, it's like a death sentence to them. But now, with the better facilities like dialysis and transplants, we are able to uh, see more number of kidney patients who have survived and were able to tell their stories. And uh, that's the reason why I think uh, because of these reasons uh, we are able to see a lot of kidney disease and kidney related issues uh, are getting into public in these days. Uh, what are the major causes of kidney dysfunction you keep seeing in your practice sir? So in general practice uh, we see two kinds of kidney disease. One is the acute kidney injury which we let's not talk about that now. But the major chunk or major burden of the society is the chronic kidney disease which in layman's uh, term we can say it's a permanent kidney failure. Now as I told you in my previous uh, question the major causes of kidney disease at least in India and worldwide is diabetes, hypertension, renal stone disease and some other kidney forms like glomerulonephritis and infections and all those things. So, but let's focus more on diabetes and hypertension which forms around 40 to 60 percent of uh, the chronic kidney disease. So, these are the major causes which are preventable and when identified early or treatable. Uh, the next question is what is the biggest myth people keep asking you in your daily practice sir? So, uh, when we see a lot of patients in ICUs and uh, we see uh, people who are really sick, the most common myth uh, or uh, I would say more co common question when uh, they come to see a nephrologist is uh, um, if you start dialysis for my patient, are you going to continue dialysis for lifelong? Now, that's a myth. Uh, because as I told you, there are two kinds of kidney disease. One is the temporary one, which in medical terminology we call it acute kidney injury. And the other one is the permanent one, which we call chronic kidney disease. Now, majority of the times when acute kidney injury patients request dialysis, they might come out of the dialysis. This is 70 to 80 percent of the times. In chronic kidney disease also, there is a temporary deterioration in the kidney function. They might go on dialysis and they might come back. So, there is a common question people are afraid of to start dialysis for the first time. And the first many times they ask me like, if I start dialysis now, should I continue dialysis for lifelong or not? That is the biggest myth I, have, uh, I usually come across in my daily practice. Sir, what are the options that are available for an end stage kidney disease patient, sir? Now, uh, uh, end stage kidney disease is like, you know, when you have the chronic kidney disease generally is divided into five stages. The fifth stage when they reach is the final stage is called end stage kidney disease. Now, generally we give two options uh, to these patients. One is the dialysis and in dialysis they have two options. One is the hemodialysis, the other one is the peritoneal dialysis which are otherwise called as home dialysis. Now, the second option, the best option is transplantation. Now, uh, what the patient wants is depends upon the patient age, patient general condition, patient financial status, patient responsibilities and how important is that particular patient in that particular family. For example, you have an earning patient who was, who was suddenly diagnosed with a end stage renal disease. Now, the best option for that person would be always be transplant rather than being on dialysis. So, it depends upon the patient but the two options are dialysis and transplantation. Sir, how is the quality of life for hemodialysis patients, sir? And what's their psychological status? Now, again, uh, it all depends upon the patient, how hard he wants to fight the disease. But the most common problems we encounter among end-stage renal disease who are going on dialysis is uh, lack of confidence, 
because the patient has to come to hospital three times a week. He has to spend at least four hours. And on the day of dialysis, his energy levels are usually low. He will not be productive on that day. And he requires multiple medications uh, to manage complications like bone disease and uh, uh, anemia and all those things. And uh, so some people are really depressed. Uh, but that's a part and parcel of the treatment. We have to keep motivating them. And especially young patients, if they are restricted, they don't have, they'll have a lot of restrictions on dialysis, like food restrictions, salt restrictions, fluid restrictions. So uh, these people uh, really feel that uh, they are missing out on, on something in their lives. So in those patients, generally we try to counsel them that uh, you can get transplant and all those things. We'll try to keep up their spirits. It's a tough job, but uh, yeah, some people face a lot of difficulties, but some people are really strong. They fight it out and uh, they continue their activities and be active on dialysis also. If one decides for a transplant, sir, how do they get it done? Whom should they approach? So generally the treating nephrologist will guide you, like uh, whether, uh, uh, if you opt for a transplant, you can approach your treating nephrologist. He will guide you on uh, the pros and cons of transplantation in your case because each, uh, even the transplant is not a blanket option for everybody. So it depends upon what your uh, actual kidney problem is and are you fit for transplant or not, all those things will be there. So when you approach your nephrologist, he will evaluate you for transplantation and he will tell you whether it will help you or not or you should go for transplant or not. What's the usual cost for the procedure, sir? So, again, depends upon where you're getting it done, in the government sector and the private sector. But let's talk about the private sector. In private hospital, it can cost you anywhere between 6 to 8 lakhs. Uh, and again, it's live or again, uh, brain dead donors, it's a different cost for everything. But somewhere around 6 to 8 lakhs should be the usual cost in uh, for the transplantation. How do you select a donor for transplantation, sir? Now, that's a good question. See, uh, in donors, generally we see uh, it's, a, it's, it's emotional and uh, it's lo requires a lot of motivation uh, to motivate a donor to donate, donate the kidney because uh, it's not a one-time this thing. The patient will lose one kidney and they require lifelong follow-up and uh, they'll have some diet restrictions and all those things. So, but generally uh, or uh, legally speaking, we can uh, take uh, only the first degree relatives like your mother, brother, uh, wife, son and uh, recently now they have included the grandfather and grandmother also. So these are the people who are allowed you to donate the kidney. Again, uh, it's, uh, we have to evaluate what is their uh, underlying uh, status, what is their functional status, how their kidneys are, are they having any other underlying disease or not, how the kidneys are functioning and then only we take for uh, the donor. If there is no compatible donor in the family sir, then how, what do we do? Now, uh, so this is again, um, now we don't have any pan-India programs like uh, Jeevandan scheme which we have in Telangana. Now, uh, in Telangana at least, when you uh, when uh, you have kidney disease, you can register with Jeevandan scheme which is a government run scheme where uh, uh, there will be, uh, uh, you will be registered based on your number of years of dialysis, your blood group and your other complications during dialysis. And once uh, any brain dead donor is willing to donate the kidney, then uh, it will go into the pool and they'll allot, allot to the individual hospitals and uh, you'll be registered under individual doctors and uh, hospitals. So that is one option. So you either have a live donor or you have can uh, just register in the Jeevandan scheme where you can get a cadaveric donor. How is the quality of life after transplant, sir? So I would say especially uh, patients who were uh, facing uh, psychological issues uh, during the dialysis who are weak or uh, people who are having uh, multiple complications like mm. you know hypotension or hypertension during dialysis and the energy levels are really low these people do very uh, I mean really good uh, post transplantation uh, so we have so many people who are back to their uh, IT jobs and who are moving abroad uh, post transplantation also so I would say the quality of life is definitely better um, than dialysis but uh, again, it again depends on person to person. But uh, when you say the quality of life versus transplantation and uh, dialysis, transplantation always has a better quality of life. Uh, once transplantation is done, will they have their normal life back or will there be restrictions, sir? Uh, yes. So post-transplantation, generally what happens is uh, they will be on medications. First three to six months are very crucial. So these people should not miss any medications. The medications are going to be for lifelong and the follow-up and the restrictions are going to be for lifelong. But these are not like bad restrictions, these are good restrictions. Like, you know, you should be active in your life, you should eat healthy diet, you should not, 
you know, uh, take good amount of fluids, uh, take your regular BP checks, take your regular medications and visit your doctors. So the night, uh, not a very bad restrictions. Don't eat outside food and you should be careful when you go out in crowds. And these are the general restrictions which you have, which are not going to hamper your day-to-day uh, -day activities, you know, uh, to very that extent that you'll feel uh, really restricted. Uh, the next question is, is the same blood group mandatory for transplant and what is a swap transplant, sir? Now, uh, so many times we see patients, uh, you know, who are, uh, who, where they have family members who are willing to donate uh, the kidney, but uh, unfortunately the blood group will not match. Now, people think that that's the end of the road, but uh, that's not the case usually. There's something called as ABO incompatible transplantation. So even the blood groups are not matching, sometimes we can do the transplantation by doing some special procedure prior to the transplantation, which is like plasmapheresis and other things, which uh, which can be explained to the patient. And uh, so ABO compatible is an option where uh, you can do transplantation with two different blood groups. So that is ABO compatible transplant. But uh, the, the, the new thing is the swap transplantation. Again, for this, we don't have a pan-India program. So in swap transplant, like, you know, uh, the people, if you don't have any um, same blood com uh, uh, compatible donor in your family, but you can give kidney to other family and the other family has the donor for your blood group, you can swap the kidneys and get the transplantation done. It requires a lot of coordination and paperwork, but uh, still we are doing it at individual institution basis. Hemodialysis or transplant, sir, which is better according to you? Uh, now, again, it's a difficult question uh, because uh, it all depends upon patient to patient. But when you look at uh, the gross things like quality of life, you know, uh, the uh, freedom to move around and then do the reg regular activities, the energy of life and all those things. For young patients, definitely I would say transplant is a better option. But again, for, uh, for you don't do transplant for everybody. For example, you have an elderly patient, you know, who doesn't move around and, uh, you know, who are who's highly prone for infections and all. You don't recommend transplant in them. But for an young patient who is a working professional, who is an earning member of the family, who is down with the kidney disease, transplant, I would say, definitely is a better option than uh, the dialysis. So the next question, sir, once you decide to do a transplant, how long does it take for the procedure, sir, to get started? Uh, so generally, we have something called as pre-transplant evaluation. So first, we'll evaluate the donor. Donor should be in a healthy condition. And uh, we'll see that uh, the donor is not having any pre-existing issues like diabetes, hypertension, because many times they're not having anything. But once we start evaluating for the donor, we'll find new problems. And uh, we make sure that uh, the kidney function is also good. So we do something called as split kidney functioning and all those things. And after that, there'll be some legal implications. We have to submit the case to the committee. So altogether, it will take somewhere between uh, two to three weeks. Once you decide you have a live transplantation, and for the Jeevandan scheme, it depends upon what's your blood group, how long you're on dialysis, and what are the other uh, complications you are facing during the dialysis. So it depends upon the blood group. In Jeevandan scheme, you can you might have to wait somewhere around one to two years. Sir, what is rejection? And when does rejection happen? And can we treat it? So uh, the rejection is the, it's a normal process because uh, your bo body has something called as immunity. So any foreign object comes to your body, body will try to reject it. Similarly, kidney is also not yours. So some foreign body is coming and it is kept in your body. So body will try to reject it. Now, uh, the reason uh, uh, we give, the reason why we give immunosuppressive medications, initially injections will be given during the transplantation process. And as you go on in the, you get discharged, you'll be converted into the tablets. Now, despite giving these medications, the chance of rejections are still there. It can happen as soon as on the operating table to the immediate post-operative period and uh, even any time during the course of the transplantation. After one year, two years also, we have seen rejection episodes. Mostly, uh, immediately one year, two years is mostly because of uh, people missing the tablets or, not, or being incompliant to the medications and all those things. Many times, if it's a mild rejection, it's treatable. We have certain medications and we have special procedures like plasmapheresis, depends upon what the rejection is. So when we suspect rejection, we'll try to do a biopsy and see what kind of rejection it is how severe is the rejection and then based on that we plan the treatment. Many times it's treatable but if it is very severe and uh, patient have uh, di uh, patient didn't come us, uh, to us early then in those uh, uh, scenarios sometimes we might lose the kidney but many of the times the rejection is treatable. Uh, many, the most common doubt people have is can any of my friends or distant relatives donate a kidney to me? 
so we have something called as uh, uh, Tissue Human Organ Transplantation Act in India. So according to that, as I told you previously, only the first degree relatives is allowed to donate the kidney to the uh, as per the law. Now, but again, if you have an emotional donor like your aunt, your uncle, your friend. Uh, so these cases will be treated as special cases and you have to do a separate uh, um, you know, legal work for that and you have to submit to the state committee and once the state committee gives the clearance you can definitely go for the transplantation but it's going to be a lengthy process and it's going to take some time and sometimes they might reject it also but if you have a genuine case to make definitely they'll accept it and uh, we, uh, you can go for with the transplantation. Do you have any final message for the audience? Uh, so the final uh, one thing I want to tell you is uh, either dialysis or transplant, both are good options for any ESRD patients or end stage patients. For any working professionals who want to have a very good quality of life, young patients or working professionals, I would definitely suggest transplantation for them. But again, we have new uh, types of dialysis uh, which can uh, you know which, which are offered to the patients now. Uh, where the quality of life is as good as normal and uh, transplantation the quality of life is going to be better than uh, dialysis definitely but again it's all depend upon case to case so you have to meet your nephrologist and uh, see what's best for you so that's the final message i want to give you thank you for any further queries you can contact dr satya narayana the link is given in the description below